This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. We're back in the courtroom. FBI cast agent Nick Balance testifying in the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. He testified initially on the 24th and then again on the 25th. We now bring you the audio testimony from the 25th of April, 2023. Take a listen. Testimony from Mr. Balance, who was previously placed under oath yesterday and is uh, in direct examination with Mr. Wood conducting the direct Court notes all the jurors are present and accounted for and would note on the record also they've all signed their juror affirmation so we appreciate your continued service with that in mind mr wood if you'd like to continue with your direct examination you can thank you your honor i'd ask the witness be hand what's been marked as states exhibit 156a i do have a courtesy copy electronically for the court as well Mr. Balance, can you quickly review State's Exhibit 156A? Do you recognize State's 156A? What is it? Hold on, I think that microphone is not turned on, it would appear. Okay. What is States 156A? This is the full copy of my report that I completed in this matter. Okay. Is that a true and accurate representation of that report? Yes, sir, it is. Your Honor, based on at the request of the defense, uh, I would move to admit State's Exhibit 156A as the true and full copy of Mr. Balance's report. All right. I'll note, uh, to clarify the record, then 156 was admitted yesterday, which uh, under Rule 1006 was a summary. Uh, the defense requested the entirety of the report, and that's now apparently been submitted. Did you have a time to review that, Mr. Thomas? Yes, Your Honor. I'll agree to it. Okay, so Exhibit 156A is now admitted. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. If I may continue publishing to the jury from 156. You may. Agent Balance, do you recognize page 26? Yes, I do. Is this the page that we finished on yesterday? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. And just to uh, get back into your testimony, can you just briefly summarize again what was found on page 26? Yes, sir. So this is looking at Google location history for Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, at that account, um, which was associated with Alex Cox and then looking at multiple locations from the Google location history record. Okay. Agent, can you tell us what's, uh, what you found and reported on page 27 of your report? Sure. So this is looking at records for the 0143 cell phone that was associated with Chad Daybell and looking at different interactions that it had with this tower and sector. So we're looking at from the call box here, between 1035 and 1220, there's multiple SMS or text messages that are exchanged with 46, the number ending 4652, which was associated with Lori Vallow. And then there's also an outgoing call to Lori Vallow that occurs at 1145 and 55 seconds. And that's on the morning of September 9th? Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, Agent, we while we're talking about uh, these interactions, uh, were you asked in your report, when you prepared a report by law enforcement, to focus on specific dates? 
Yes, I was. Okay. Um, and in doing your investigation, did you look at other dates as well? I did. Was it common for the numbers between Chad Daybell, attributable to Chad Daybell, and the numbers attributed to Lori Vallow, did they communicate frequently? They did. Okay, thank you. So even on the dates not mentioned in this report, they communicated frequently? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. If you can finish what you were explaining to the jury about uh, slide 27. So the only other thing I would point out is, again, we talked about it yesterday, but this is representative of Chad Daybell's residence by the green icon here. Okay. So his, his cell phone was being serviced by the, the tower located in St. Anthony at the time? Correct. Okay. And that would provide coverage to the Daybell residence. What did you find in report in slide 30? So this was going back to looking at the Google location history for the Homer J. Maximus account associated with Alex Cox. And so if you look, it's going to be between 1142 and 1147, so a shorter time window. But there's two location points here at 1142 and 1145, just north of the Daybell residence. And then the next one that we see is at 1146 and then 1147, which would be consistent with that device leaving the area of the Daybell residence traveling south towards Rexburg. Okay. And just as a, as a brief refresher, the, the blue pointer, what kind of geolocation data is that? Sure. So... Basically, on the Google location record from what we talked about yesterday, you'll see the type of how it's being reported to Google. So we see a GPS, which is represented with red, and then we see the blue, which would be representative of a Wi-Fi report. Okay. Of a Wi-Fi report. Okay. So between slides 26 and 30, uh, can you just briefly summarize where the phone, the phone attributable to Alex Cox's Homer J. Maximus account was located? In the vicinity of the Chad Daybell residence. What did you refine? What did you find and report on slide thirty-one? So this page is showing three different accounts or phone numbers and what tower and sectors those were utilizing. So the three numbers are at the top, 0143, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell, 9120, which would be attributed to Alex Cox, and then 4652, which would be attributed to Lori Vallow. So the interaction here is going to be associated with 0143. That's an outgoing call to 4652 at 11.45 and 55 seconds. And then down here, you can see the other side of that call where it's being received by the 4652 phone from the 0143. Additionally, you see an outgoing call from 9120, which would be attributed to Alex Cox, also to 4652. And then you can see it being received down here by the 4652 phone. So basically what that's saying is during the call made by the 0143 phone attributed to Chad Daybell, it was using a tower that would provide coverage to the Daybell residence. At the time 9120 makes the call to 4652, it would also be utilizing a tower that would provide coverage to the Daybell residence. And then finally down here, 4652, when it's receiving those two calls, would be utilizing a tower that would provide coverage to Rexburg. And all these calls were taking place shortly after the phone attributable to Alex Cox left the Daybell residence, correct? That's correct. What did you find and report on slide 34? So again, this is a short duration, but we're looking at 0143 for uh, towers and sectors that were utilized for two different interactions, one an incoming SMS from 4652. The other is an outgoing SMS to 4652 utilizing the first tower would be up 
providing coverage to the Daybell residents. Then this tower down here, when I looked at the drive test data associated with it, does provide coverage all the way up to the Daybell residents. So when I spoke yesterday, when you're looking at two different towers that are being utilized within close proximity and time, like this one, where you have approximately a little over a minute, you the phone would need to be near an area where there's overlapping coverage associated with both of those towers and sectors. And what did you find in report on slide 36? So this is a few minutes later, the 0143 phone attributed to Chad Daybell receiving an incoming SMS using a tower that would provide coverage down to Rexburg. Looking at the drive test data of that particular tower, that tower would not provide coverage up to the Daybell residence. So at this point, the, that phone attributable to Chad Daybell is uh, within the coverage of that tower, but not within the coverage of the tower that provides coverage to his home? Correct. So if you look between this page and the one previous, you'll see that this tower is slightly west of the tower that was utilized during the previous interaction on um, page 35 of the report. What did you find and report on slide 38? Okay, so this is going to show interactions between three different numbers, 0143 attributed to Chad Daybell, 9120 attributed to Alex Cox, and 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow between 1243 and 1249. So to start with the 0143, you see an outgoing and an incoming SMS utilizing this tower and sector. And then since both 9120 and 4652 were Verizon phones. They're going to be utilizing the same tower and sector. So you can see both the black and the blue are represented here if utilizing that same tower and sector. And so basically what this is showing is these towers are utilizing, or these phones are utilizing towers and sectors with an overlapping coverage area down in Rexburg. And this was again on September 9th? That is correct, September 9th from 12.43 to 12.49 p.m. Okay. Agent, can you tell us what you found and reported on slide 42? Yes, so this was a second date that I was asked to analyze and determine if there was any information that could indicate general locations of phones. And this was September the 23rd of 2019. So we're looking at a time period from 3.59 in the morning until 8.35 in the morning and looking at tower interactions by 0143, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell. So basically there's numerous outgoing SMS messages and one incoming SMS or text message that occur during that time window starting at 3.59 and then going to 8.34 in the morning. And those were all with 4652, a phone that was attributed to Lori Vallow. What did you find and report on slide 43? So this was from Google Location History for Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, which was associated with Alex Cox between 9.01 in the morning and 9.41 in the morning. And the locates all repeat with a 15-meter margin of error consistent with that device being Alex Cox's residence. And so just, can you just remind again what the, the yellow circle with the R means? Certainly. So the yellow circle is the margin of error. So when we see here, all of these have a margin of error of 15 meters. So that yellow circle is representative of what 15 meters looks like for that margin of error. And what did you find in report on slide 44? So this is looking at a tower interaction of 9374, which was attributed to Chad Daybell, 
and this shows an outgoing call to 9120, which was attributed to Alex Cox, and that during that time, this is a, the 9374 is a Verizon phone, unlike the previous orange tower and sector we've seen up here. So it would be utilizing a different tower and sector since it's a different network. And so this tower and sector does provide coverage to the Daybell residents. And what did you find and report on slide 47? So this is looking at interactions for two different phones, 0143, the Ch number attributed to Chad Daybell, and then 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow between, on September the 23rd, 2019, between 927 and 937, and basically shows the 0143 number utilizing three different towers. and shows the different activity. So specifically to this tower, we see outgoing call, an outgoing text message, and an incoming text message. All of those are with exchanged with 4652. We see an outgoing call with 4652 on this tower and sector. And then we see an incoming SMS from 4652 on this tower and sector. And again, what date was this? This is September the 23rd, 2019. Okay, so that upper right-hand box, those are uh, three calls between a phone attributable to Chad Daybell and a phone attributable to Lori Vallow, correct? That's correct. And, uh, and those all take place between 9.30 and 9.35? And nine, yeah, correct. Okay. Um, And there's then in the, the box to the left, there's another call. That's correct. In those same phones at 936? Correct. Okay. Uh, that bottom box. So that's showing the tower and sector utilized by 4652 during that time range, and you see two of the calls here being in communication with 0143. Okay. So that, that's representative of those other calls that we that are discussed above? Yes, correct. Okay, but just from another tower? Yes, correct. All right, and this, again, September 23rd between 9.27 and 9.37 a.m.? That's correct. What did you find and report on slide 48? This is looking specific to Google location history for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox showing between 945 and 949 that the device reporting to that Google account moved from the area down here in Rexburg near Alex Cox's residence north. So if we can go to uh, the bottom box in purple, what does that represent? So this represents a Google location the type is going to be Wi-Fi, and then the margin of error is 100 meters. And so when I talked yesterday about if you put every single date, time, margin of error, and latitude, longitude on every single one of these, it makes a map that's difficult to read. So instead, what you're looking at is a summary box over here to where you have one Wi-Fi location and 10 GPS locations. The margin of error for the Wi-Fi is the 100 meters reported here, and then three to seven meters for the GPS locations that are reported going north. And so basically, the two times that are reported here and here are more of a bookend showing the start and the end of this particular page and what I'm representing with this time period. Okay. So to summarize, on September 23rd, Alex, uh, a phone attributable to Alex Cox uh, is within 100 meters of, well, I don't want to misstate that, is within 100 meters of that Wi-Fi signal in the general location of Lori Vallow's apartment, correct? That's correct, just northwest of where just, the apartment is. Just northwest of it. Uh, and then by 949, um, he's moving up what looks to be Highway 20, uh, and there he's being pinged by GPS. Ten times. So basically, um, 
not to correct you, but a ping would be basically something to where the carrier or company sent out a request for okay. a location. This isn't a ping. This is basically looking at a location that was reported. So, in essence, there's no request from the company to locate where the device is. This is just stored information of where it is. And so during that time window, everything else you said is correct, that the phone is moving north and at 949 is indicating consistent with it being on Highway 20 with a three-meter margin of error. Okay, and that's September 23rd? Correct. Was that a date you were asked to specifically look at? Yes, it was. Um, why was that? Uh, that was a date that was indicated um, that potentially there was um, – an event that occurred in the investigation, and that was based off of what investigators were looking at of last known times whenever um, J.J. Ballo was alive. Okay. So, and just to make sure I don't speak incorrectly, a ping is when the cell company sends out a signal. Correct. So say, for instance, I can give a pretty good example for it. If we were looking for a missing person that had went hiking in the woods, we can request that the cell phone carrier ping the phone to determine its location of where it is now. And so they're initiating on their network a request to locate versus looking at historical records that are already maintained by the provider. Okay, thanks. What did you find and report on slide 49? So these are from the Google location history for Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, which was attributed to Alex Cox, and looking at different locations that were reported around the Chad Daybell residence on September 23rd, 2019, between 9.55 and 10.12 or 10.13. Uh, can you walk us through those as, as they occurred chronologically? Yes, so the first one that we see is going to be at 9.55 and 6 seconds, which is going to be a 50-meter margin of error showing the center point just northwest of the Daybell residence. And then we see at 9.56 a much smaller margin of error with a GPS hit of 4 meters, and that's again at 9.56, and that is an area kind of just northeast of a small pond and then we see the next one, 957, a much larger margin of error via Wi-Fi, um, which shows 100 meters centered here, kind of in the middle of the yard. And then next we see 1002, another very small margin of error of 3 meters, GPS, and indicating a close proximity to the location where J.J. Vallow was located. Beyond that, we see additionals at 10.05, 10.07, and 10.12, anywhere from 28 meters to 60 or 92 meters margin of error. Um, the last one that we see shown in this particular page is at 10.12 and 42 seconds. Okay. So to summarize, on September 23rd, 2019, between 9.55 and 10.12, a phone attributable to Alex Cox uh, was located at those spots on Chad Daybell's residence? That's correct. Okay. What did you find and report on slide 51? So this is looking at network interactions with 0143 attributed to Chad Daybell between, on September 23rd, 2019, between 9.30 in the morning and 10.27 in the morning. This shows the use of two different towers and sectors, and I can go through each box. Um, there's an outgoing call to 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow, and everything in this box looks like it's going to be the same um, interactions with 4652 to include outgoing and in outgoing and incoming text messages, as well as outgoing calls. And then the same thing over here. Um, there is one number that I don't recognize, but 4652 has two interactions with the 0143 phone at 936 and 1026. 
So the other thing I'll point out is that, as you can see, this is at, we have 936 in interaction with this tower. We have 935 in interaction with this tower. So that's one I talked about yesterday to where when a phone is utilizing two different towers and sectors, we can look at that phone is likely located very near to the overlapping coverage area versus being all the way up here in St. Anthony and then one minute later being down here closer to this particular tower and sector. So what I looked at with the drive test, which was mapped on one of the pages yesterday, is that the overlapping coverage of these two towers and sectors includes the Chad Daybell residence. Mm -hmm. Chad Daybell residence. Yes, ma'am. And so in that box on the right, you have between 930 and 1016, I count eight communications between a phone attributable to Chad and a phone attributable to Lori? Yes, that's what I count as well. Okay. And then on the box to the left, uh, between 936 and 1026? I count two. There are two. Okay. What did you find in report on slide 54? So this is Google location history attributed to Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, associated with Alex Cox, on September the 23rd from 10.12 in the morning until 10.20 in the morning. The locate we have at 10.12 reported to Google shows it in the vicinity of the Chad Daybell residence. And then the next one that we see at 10.20 shows it down closer towards Rexburg, consistent with movement away from the Dayville residence, going south towards Rexburg. And that 10, 12, 42, had you already put that on a, and let me, let me clarify that, in the upper box, um, that finding, was that on one of the previous slides? Yes, I believe it was. It was the last uh location of that phone of the Homer the phone attributable to Homer J. Maximus and Alex Cox on Chad Daybell's residence that morning, correct? That's correct. Okay. And so then about eight minutes later, he's south down in the Rexburg area. That's correct. Or I should say that phone is down south in the Rexburg area. Correct. What did you find and report on slide 55? Okay, so this is looking at three different phones and the interactions that they have with the network. 4652, which would be attributed to Lori Vallow. 9120, attributed to Alex Cox. And 0143, attributed to Chad Daybell. So starting with the interactions that the 0143 phone had, there were three outgoing SMS messages that were sent. Um all of them at 1016. Then we see the 9120 phone, that it makes an outgoing call to the 4652 phone. And then this is showing the 4652 phone receiving that call at 1013. And then the duration of that call was 545 seconds. So for the 515, 4020, and 43, and the 9120 phone, both of those are using towers that would provide coverage to the Daybell residence. And then the 4652 phone is utilizing a tower and sector that would provide coverage to down in Rexburg to include uh, Lori Vallow's residence. Okay, so and just to, to clarify then, in that upper box, you have three messages within a minute from a phone attributable to Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow at 1016 the morning of September 23? That's correct. Okay. And then the middle box is a phone attributable to Alex Cox on a 545-second phone call with a phone attributable to Lori Vallow. That's correct. And that's at 1013. Correct in the morning? Correct. Okay. Um, and then that bottom box is reflective of that same call? Yes, it is. From... Uh, from the uh, call detail records of the phone attributable to Lori. Correct. Okay. Uh, 
we've been talking about um, Alex, uh, these those specific dates, uh, September 9th and September 23rd, that you were asked to look at. Uh, and on both those occasions, Alex Cox's phone shows up on Chad Daybell's residence. Did you look at any other times where uh, the Homer J. Maximus account or a phone at- associated with it was found on Chad Daybell's residence? I did. Oh, what did you find? So I found that that phone did go to the Chad Daybell residence on other occasions. Um, the num- the exact number escapes me. It was definitely less than 10. Um, did you ever find another time where the location given was in the backyard? So specific to the Google location, as you've seen already, there's a margin of error associated with each particular locate that you see. So on some of those other dates, I did see where the margin of error included the backyard. I didn't see any time where there was a locate that was a very small margin of error that only included the backyard. Thank you. Agent, what did you find and report on slide 59? So this was looking at the Google location history for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox on October the 8th, 2019, between 2.59 p.m. and 3.37 p.m., which was consistent with that phone visiting the Walmart in Rexburg, which the satellite (laughs) photo shows it under construction, but it had been completed at the time that these locates were recorded. Okay. So were they, it looks like there was one GPS hit and the rest were Wi-Fi? That's correct. So you'll see similar to one of the earlier pages to where I will do basically what I would call bookending of taking the first record that I have in this time window and the last record and showing those two specifically, but then also including the summary box, which shows that there's a total of 18 Wi-Fi locations reported during that time window. That's the Walmart in Rexburg, Idaho? That's correct. On October 8th? That's correct. What did you find and report on slide 60? So as a part of looking at the different records that we received that we're asked to review in a case, um, Verizon is one carrier that maintains a short retention period for the content of text messages. So upon reviewing that, I saw two different text messages that were associated with the 9374 phone attributed to Chad Daybell. And so the content of those messages were the first one, going to stop by the store right now to get that other number working. Hopefully it won't take long. And then the second one was, I will call right now from a 401 number. So when we look at these different records, a lot of times one of the biggest tasks we have is to take whatever time zone a particular record is reported in and convert it to the local time. So here, these records are going to be listed in Eastern Daylight Time, and so they were converted to Idaho local time. So this one at the top, that occurs at 9.57 in the morning, and then the second message occurs at 10.26 in the, 1026 in the morning, Idaho time. Are you able to tell from that data uh, who the text message was sent to? I am. So if you look at the terminating number here, you'll see 808-755-5452, and that's the same on both of those text messages. And do you know who that number is attributable to? I have that number attributed to Lori Vallow. Okay. And that was from, it was from 690-9374 attributable to Chad Daybell, correct? That's correct. On the 9th? Of October? That's correct. And what did you find in report in slide 61? So what I found here was, first I'll t- point out the location of WR, which was Wireless Revolution, LLC, which was a store that sold um, devices that could be used on AT&T's network. So then we're looking at 
network interactions between 9374, attributed to Chad Daybell, and then 8260, attributed to Chad Daybell as well. And so what we see is which towers and sectors were being utilized in close proximity to the time of the messages that were sent shown in the previous page. So here at 1027 in the morning, this would be representative of the blue tower and sector. A260 has a voice call with the number ending 5452. And then this tower and sector is utilized by 9374. And it's a voice call to a number that I don't recognize as part of my report. Okay. And that vo uh, the voice call in in the blue box between the 401 number and the 5452 number, how long was that after the text that was sent in the previous slide? Do you recall? I don't recall the exact timestamp of the previous. So looking at it now, that would be it's showing 1226. Again, that's in Eastern time. So it would be 1026 and 35 seconds. And then 1027 and 14 seconds when that call is made. Okay. And so just to, for clarification, what does the text say in that bottom box? It says, I will call right now from a 401 number. Okay, and that was at 1026? Correct, 1026 and 35 seconds. And then at 1027, there's a, a call from a 401 number to that same number attributable to Lori Ballow, correct? That's correct. And that 401-569-8260 number, who is that attributable to? Chad Daybell. Thank you. That's on October 9th. That's correct. What did you find and report on slide 65? So this was just additional reporting of 9374 attributed to Chad Daybell and 8260 also attributed to Chad Daybell. And so what I'm looking at here is date and times and usage of the network. And if those phones appear, to, it's cons whether it's consistent with those two phones being in the same general location. And so you can see there's the blue tower and sector here as well as here. And then there's the green tower and sector here. The green is associated with 9374. And then the blue is associated with 8260. Okay, and 8260, is that the number we were just discussing that was activated that day on October 9th? That is correct. Okay. And who is who is that number communicating with in that upper right box? So up here you see an incoming voice call from 4652 attributed to <laughs> Lori Vallow. And then you see multiple text messages exchanged with a number 334-744-4205. And who is that number attributable to? To Alex Cox. Okay. And what time of day are those communications? So we're looking at, from the top, 111 until 222 in the afternoon. Okay. And then in the, oh, 111 to 222 covers the whole, the whole slide, correct? Yes, sir, correct. Okay. Uh, the, the middle box with blue on the right, what is that communication? So that's another representation of an interaction 8260 has with the network, receiving a message from the 4205 number utilizing a different tower and sector. Okay. And then the bottom box? And the bottom is showing um, three outgoing calls, and I don't recognize any of the numbers. Do you recognize the outgoing number? That's, I'm sorry, that's 9374 associated with Chad Daybell. I don't recognize any of the numbers that it's calling. Okay. And in the middle box, who were, I, I don't believe you said who those numbers are attributable to. Yep. So 8260, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell, and 4205 attributed to Alex Cox. Okay. Thank you. What did you find and report on slide 70? So this is looking at Google location history between on October the 9th, 2019, between 12 o'clock p.m. and 1.23 p.m. for the Homer J. Maximus account associated with Alex Cox. 
And so basically during that time, we see a total of 18 Wi-Fi reports or locations reported via Wi-Fi that would be consistent with that device being at the Lori Ballow residence. Okay, so 18 hits between 12 o'clock and 1.23 p.m. on October 9th? That's correct. Okay. And what did you <coughs> report on slide 72? So this is an extremely short time window of about 32 seconds, but looking at the first one beginning at 1.23 and 0 seconds, consistent with being at Lori Vallow's apartment and showing movement, consistent with that device moving over to Alex Cox's residence by 123 and 32 seconds. All right. So just if you'll move us chronologically from each box. So we're starting with 123 and 0 seconds, which would be this location here. The second location would be 123 and 16 seconds, and then 123 and 32 seconds. And that's October 9th still? That's correct. And what did you report on slide 73? So, again, this is Google location history associated with Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, attributed to Alex Cox between 123 and 237. A total of 28 Google locations are being represented here all consistent with that device being at the Alex Cox residence. Until 2.37 on October 9th. That's correct. And what, you re what did you report on slide 75? So again, this is Google location history for Homer J. Maximus, attributed to Alex Cox, showing movement from 2.42 and 7 seconds south towards Idaho Falls, and another one down in Idaho Falls to end this summary at 314 and 43 seconds. And again, I have a summary box to show that there's a total of eight locations reported during that time window, which would be consistent with that device traveling from Rexburg down to Idaho Falls. Okay, and so your, your start time, if I'm correct, is 242 on October 9th. 2.42 p.m., and that's in Rexburg? Correct. And then the end the end time is at 3.14 uh, in Idaho Falls, where you have it located at SW, which I believe you said stands for Sportsman's Warehouse. That's correct. And without looking at it, that 72-meter margin of error, um, without it being zoomed in, I wouldn't want to say specifically it's located at Sportsman's Warehouse, but definitely in the vicinity. Okay. Thank you. What did you report in slide 76? So this is looking at Google location history again for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox. On October the 9th from 342 until 412, reporting a total of 18 Google locations via Wi-Fi that show it consistent with that device being located at the Sportsman's Warehouse. Okay. And so just to summarize, on October 9th from 342, to 412, the phone associated with Alex Cox is consistently being located within the sportsman's warehouse. Yes, sir, that's correct. What did you report on slide 77? So this, again, is showing Google location history for Homer J. Maximus, attributed to Alex Cox, showing movement starting... Well, the total window is going to be from 447 to 456, but starting down here at the 447 time frame, the locations here are all going to be GPS, indicating movement consistent with it traveling up towards the Daybell residence and then directly east away from the Daybell residence. And we just walk us through those boxes chronologically or and those hits? Yes, for sure. So we're looking at 447 down here in the vicinity of Highway 20, and I believe that's Salem Road. The next one that we see is 449, consistent with northbound travel by that device on Salem Road. 451, consistent with it being in the area of the Daybell residence. 
455 east from the previous locate, consistent with travel east on, I can't remember the name of this road off the top of my head, um, but then we're looking at 456 and 7 seconds, which is the final one for this particular page. And so on that final one on that particular page, he's located uh, what looks to be uh, east of the Chad Daybell residence. That's correct. Uh, but on that same that same road that leads to Chad Daybell's residence. Correct. That would be consistent with the locates that I reviewed. And that was that, that last one, I'm sorry, was it 456? Yes, sir. 456 and 7 seconds. Okay, thank you. What did you report on slide 78? So continuing with Google location history for Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox, the first one represented here we see at 457 via locate via Wi-Fi with a 68-meter margin of error. The next one that we see is at 4.58, nine seconds, consistent with the device moving back west. And then the final one that we see is at 5.03 and 55 seconds, which is a GPS. The type is GPS, and it has a three-meter margin of error. So, and, and to clarify, you, you can't determine the exact route he took to get there? No, I cannot. Okay. Uh, but what you can state is that at 4.58, uh, he's located by GPS on that same road that Chad Daybell's residence is located on. And at 5.03, he is then down uh, just west of Sugar City. That's correct. Okay. And can you just point out Sugar City? Thank you. And... Where is Sugar City in relation to Rexburg? Just north. Okay. Uh, is it fair to say it's somewhat in between Rexburg and Chad Daybell's residence? Yes, sir. And then what did you report on slide 79? So continuing with lo Google location history for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox, this is looking at a much larger time window between 5.16 p.m., and 11.53 p.m. on October the 9th of 2019, a total of 66 locations, and all of those would be consistent with that device being in the area of Alex Cox's residence. And so when we're looking at the two different boxes here, again, that's representing the start and end for the time window that I was looking at. So starting at 5.16 and 32 seconds, ending at 11.53 and 9 seconds. Okay, so from that period, 516 on October 9th to 1153, that phone appears to stay at Alex Cox's residence. That's correct. Okay. What did you report on slide 80? So this is looking at network interactions that 8260 had, utilizing two different towers and sec two different towers, um, one northeast of the Daybell residence and one southwest of the Daybell residence. And so looking at the activity specific to each tower and sector, we see numerous text messages exchanged. A260, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell, and 4652, attributed to Lori Vallow, as well as the number ending 4205, attributed to Alex Cox. Those are between 528 and 1031. And then when we go over to the other tower and sector that was utilized during this time window, we see four outgoing text messages to 4205, which would be attributed to Alex Cox, starting at 713 p.m. and ending at 843 p.m. Okay. And was, Oct was October 9th the date you were asked to analyze these records for? I was. And do you know what the significance of that date was? On that date, there was specifically someone who had attempted to um, rob Tammy Daybell, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, to that box on the left, 
what is the first time that the that 401 569 8260 number attributable to Chad messages the 4205 attributed to Alex Cox? So the first time on that was at 713 in two seconds. Okay, and then in the second box, how many times and at what times? Well, let me ask this first. How many times does the phone, the 401-569-8260 attributable to Chad, communicate with the 4205 number attributable to Ch- uh, to Alex Cox? So I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six times. Okay. And what is the first time in that r- the box on the right? 7.30 and 10 seconds. And the last time? On the box on the right, the last time for 42.05, I show 10.29 and 4 seconds. Okay. And just to clarify, your times are in military time, correct? Yes, on the call boxes they are. Okay. Is that how that data is reported to you? It is, and it's the easiest way for me to map it out without going back and forth between AM and PM. Okay. Um, but if we look at your heading, that shows that these communications all took place on October 9th between 528 PM and 1032 PM. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Uh, what did you report on slide 84? So we are looking at October 18th of 2019, between 11.02 in the morning and 12.20 in the afternoon. Google location history for Homer J. Maximus, which would be attributed to Alex Cox. And during that time window, it shows consistently to be at Lori Vallow's residence. And this is October 18th, 2019? Yes, sir. That's correct. And what did you report on slide 85? So this is looking at interactions that 8260 attributed to Chad Daybell had with the network. And so I'm showing that there's two outgoing text messages, one incoming. All of those were with the 4652 phone attributed to Lori Vallow. And what did you report on slide 86? Continuing to look at interactions that 8260 attributed to Chad Daybell had with the network between 136 in the afternoon and 854 in the afternoon on October the 18th, 2019, utilizing two different towers and sectors, both that would provide coverage to the Daybell residents and showing interactions or text messages exchanged between 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow, as well as one outgoing message that goes to 4205 attributed to Alex Cox. And what time was that message at? The message to Alex Cox was sent at 844 and 43 seconds. Okay. And in the box on the left, what does that show? So those are showing... um, three text messages exchanged with 4652 and one outgoing call to 4652, which was 2,964 seconds. Okay. Um, And that call was at what time? The call was at 140 and 58 seconds. What did you report on slide 87? So this is continuing with network interactions that 8260 had on October the 18th, 2019, between 9.35 p.m. and 10.55 p.m., utilizing two different towers and sectors. And so specific to this tower and sector here, we see multiple text messages exchanged with 4205, attributed to Alex Cox. And then on this box down here, again, all of the interactions are text messages and exchanged with 4205 attributed to Alex Cox. 
both of these towers and sectors would provide coverage to the Chad Daybell residents. Yeah, so between, on October 18th, between 9.35 p.m. and 10.55 p.m., these are all text messages between the, the 401 Five six nine eight two six zero attributable to Chad Daybell, and the uh, four two zero five number attributed to Alex Cox. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and we see the two different tower uh, signals up there. What what's the significance of that to you? So, again, it goes back to overlapping coverage, and which, if you're looking at the interactions, only occurred on this tower and sector then basically that would give me an area that would be representative of the coverage area where that phone would generally be located. But whenever I have two towers and sectors that are used in close proximity and time, then I can look at that. It's more likely that that phone is located in the overlapping coverage areas for both of those towers and sectors. And that specifically includes the Chad Daybell residence. Okay, and how many communications is that in that period between 9.35 and 10.55? So we have nine on this tower and sector here. And if my eyes are working right, I see seven over here. Okay. Agent, did you notice a pattern uh once that 401 number was activated in between communications with Chad Daybell and Alex Cox and Lori Dallow? I would just note that it had heavy interactions with both phones attributed to both of those persons. Okay. And what does slide 88 represent? So this shows back to Google location history for Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox. On October the 18th, 2019, between 10.05 and 10.07 p.m., which is consistent with movement coming northbound on Salem Road towards Salem Church. The first locate that we see is at 10.05 and 57 seconds with a margin of error of 7 meters. The report type is GPS. Then the last one that we see only about a minute and some change later at 10.07 and 13 seconds. Again, reporting via GPS with a margin of error of 11 meters. And is this within that same time frame that was covered in the last slide? Yes. And that Salem Church, where is that located uh, in relation to Chad Daybell's property? Just south of it. What did you report on slide 89? So this is looking at Google location history again for Homer J. Maximus, attributed to Alex Cox between 1007 and 1045. And so what we see is a total of 13 Google locations, 12 via Wi-Fi, one via GPS. The first one that we see is the, I believe it's going to be the same one as previously reported on the page prior at 10.07 and 13 seconds with a margin of error of 11 meters represented here by the red GPS logo. And then the final one that we see during this time window is at 10.45 and 26 seconds, which is a 50 meter margin of error and represented by one of the blue Wi-Fi hits here. Okay. So there were... In the box on the right, I'm sorry, uh, on the box on the right, you're showing uh, the, the last hit in that area? Correct. And that's a Wi-Fi hit? That's correct. Um, and the radius is 50 meters? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, and then the, when he arrived there at 10.07, or I should say that phone arrived there at 10.07, Correct. The phone arrived at approximately 10.07. Okay. And October 18th, uh, was that another date you were asked to look at? It was. And what is the do you know what the significance of that date is? I do. I know overnight um, Tammy Daybell was um, found deceased. 
Okay. So between October 18th and the early morning hours of October 19th. Okay. And so then just to summarize this slide, on October 18th, 2019, a phone attributable to Alex Cox was located at the Salem Church just south of Chad Daybell's residence from 10.07 to 10.45. Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, can you point out just quickly on this map uh, the Chad Daybell residence and the Salem Church? Yes. So the Chad Daybell residence is represented here in green, and then Salem Church is represented here with SC. Okay. And what did you report on slide 90? This is looking at network interactions between 8260, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell on October the 18th, 2019 between 11.34 and 11.36 p.m. Utilizing this tower and sector here, which provides coverage to the Daybell residence. And there are three outgoing text messages at 11.34, 31 seconds, 11.35 and five seconds, and 11.35 and 28 seconds. All three of those are going to 4652, which is attributed to Lori Valla. Okay. Now, you've, you've probably already answered this, but are you able to look at the content of the messages from those records that you have access to? I'm not. Okay. And what did you report on slide 91? So this is a network interaction of 9120, which is attributed to Alex Cox on October the 18th, 2019 at 11.53 p.m., utilizing this tower and sector, which would provide coverage to kind of southwest Rexburg. And it is an outgoing call of 977 seconds to a number ending 4652, which is attributed to Lori Valla. Okay. So 977 seconds. Do you know how many minutes that is? Roughly 16 minutes, if I'm doing my math right. Okay. And that was at 11.53 on October 18th? Yes, sir. Correct. Thank you. What did you report on slide 92? So this is showing the other piece of that call, um, the 9120 number calling the 4652 number and the location of the 4652 number at the time, which would have been in Kauai, um, I'm reporting at the top in Mountain Daylight Time, so that 11.53 p.m. And then the call box here is just showing local time in Hawaii whenever that call was received. So that would be 7.53? That's correct. Okay. Um, and Kauai, I see it's on your slide, but that is an island in Hawaii? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And so Lori Vallow's phone on October 18th was at least that phone that ended in 4652 was located in Hawaii. Yes, sir. That's correct. What did you report on slide 93? So this is looking at, and I can tell already that this is going to be incorrect at the top, but this is looking at um, the time around that call. So October the 18th, at 11.54 p.m., Google location history associated with Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox, showing southbound movement consistent with it traveling south on Highway 20 between 11.54 p.m. and then into the next day, October 19th, at 12.09 a.m. Okay. Um, so just to be clear at the top, that should say October... That should say October 18th, and that should say October 19th. Okay. Um, and so at approximately 11.54, he hits on a Wi-Fi south of Rexburg. Is that accurate? That's correct. And then at 12.09, uh, he is uh, just north of Idaho Falls? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Well, I should, to be clear, hit that phone is there. Correct.
What did you report on October 22nd? So this is looking at interactions of both the 8260 number attributed to Chad Daybell as well as the 9374 number attributed to Chad Daybell <clears throat> being utilized in Utah. Um, specifically, the tower interactions here are going to be in the area of Springville, Utah. And do you know what the significance of October 22nd is? I don't know if it was the exact date, but I know that there was a burial service for Tammy Daybell around that time. Okay. And so in that top box, uh, the 401-569-8260 number attributable to Chad, who was that phone connect, uh, communicating with? So utilizing this tower and sector, there's three incoming text messages that are received from 4652, which would be attributed to Lori Valla. Okay. And in that box in the middle, who are those communications between? So this is another incoming text message that 8260 has from 4652, attributed to Lori Vallow. Okay. And, and the, I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to continue to the other two. Yeah. So we're looking at the other two interactions 8260 has, which are both outgoing text messages at 402, both to 4652, attributed to Lori Vallow. And then we also see an outgoing call on the 9374 phone attributed to Chad Daybell with a number that I don't recognize. Okay. And what did you report on slide 96? And so this is just a more zoomed in piece of the previous page. And basically what it's showing, I was provided an address for a Holiday Inn as well as an address for the Evergreen Cemetery and this is just showing that these towers and sectors that were utilizing were utilized, excuse me, during that time would provide coverage to both of those locations. Okay, and are those the same communications as on the previous page? Yes, sir, they are. Okay. Just more in detail to show the approximate location by cell tower. Yes, cuz any time that I'm mapping, that's usually the difficulty is you either zoom in too far and it takes away things or you zoom out too far and you can't see specifically um, locations. Okay. And what did you report on slide 102? So this is an interaction with the network of 480-692-9612, which I had attributed to Ty Lee Ryan. And it's showing the from the records that I had the last usage of that phone, which is where it's receiving two incoming messages, and that's December the fifteenth at approximately twelve twenty-five p.m. Utilizing a tower out in Kauai. And that number is attributable to Tylee Ryan. You said that's correct. On December fifteenth. That's correct. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Thomas, are you going to be conducting cross? I am, Judge. All right. You can do so. Are you going to take a mid-morning break, or am I going to – I don't want to get cut off in 10 minutes, so – well, you probably get cut off in 15 minutes. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, let's let's start the cross if you don't mind. Oh, and sure. Take a break in about 15. Uh, Special Agent Nick Balance, right? Yes, sir. All right. So what, what does it take to become a special agent? So it's an application process that you would put in with the FBI. Um, you'd go through it and typically takes, depending on a particular person's situation, about a year to two years to get through the process. So you start out as just an agent and then you move to a special agent? 
No, you would start off as a special agent. Oh. Well, what's so special about it? I mean, is it just, you're an FBI agent, is that right? So the correct position is an FBI special agent. There's not an FBI agent position. I got you. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background. Where did you, uh, where did you go to school? Where did you go to college? So I went to school in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Okay. Uh, and when did you graduate from there? That would have been in 2007. Okay. And you got your bachelor's degree? Yes, sir. Correct. In, in what? Criminal justice and psychology. And I think you said you worked for the Marshals, is that right? For the yeah. U.S. Marshals? Yes, sir. That's was that your first job out of college? It was, yes, sir. Okay. And how long were you with them? For approximately nine years. And did you get that job in 2007 when you graduated? Yes, sir, I did. And then you started working for the FBI in 2016? Yes, sir. Correct. And you got your special agent uh, certification a year later? So I went to Quantico, Virginia, which is where all new agents would go to in 2016, and I graduated in November of 2016. How long is that program? The time I went through, I believe it was 22 or 23 weeks. So about six months, five months? Yes, sir. Okay. And is it, um, is it like an eight-hour-a-day job type schooling, or what, what kind of hours do you do in Quantico? So they usually run it, I believe, if I remember correctly, again, um, it's eight hours, so anywhere from 7.30 to 4.30. Okay. Uh, and then you started working for the FBI. What, what was your first uh, uh, assignment? What did you do when you first got out? So I was assigned to the Pittsburgh Division and the Charleston, West Virginia Resident Agency. And I guess well, that's helpful, but I kind of wanted to know what, what did you do? Sure. So typically our larger field offices will specialize in working one specific violation just because there's a lot of agents that work at the field office. Anytime you're working in a smaller field office, you just might work multiple violations just because there's less people to work the particular violations. So whenever I started in West Virginia, I was primarily assigned to working white collar investigations and crimes against children investigations. White collar and crimes against children. Um, and when you start out, um, do you have like a caseload, like so many cases that you're assigned? How does that work? Sure, you would be assigned cases, and then you can uh, proactively look for cases as well that you can work under the violations that you're working. Okay. So you're assigned out of the Pittsburgh um, office, but to Charleston, uh, West Virginia? Yes, sir, correct. And how many cases did you carry when you were in Charleston at a time? I mean, just Sure. Roughly. Somewhere between probably five and ten. And how long did it generally take to, I mean, I'm not going to say solve the cases, but close the cases maybe? Sure. So if I'm assigned a case that hasn't been worked at all, so say I'm the first agent that's assigned to that case, mm -hmm. typically you'd look at probably a year or more um, that you would be working that investigation. But there's also cases that an agent was assigned previously and say that person is transferred to another division, is assigned somewhere different. So you can inherit cases as well. So you could inherit a case towards the beginning or something that's already has a conviction and is just waiting on somebody to be sentenced for it. Okay. And so five to ten cases, is that typical throughout the Bureau or just for you? Was that typical for you? I think it would vary significantly depending on what particular squad um, you're looking at throughout the Bureau. Okay. Uh, and then I believe you said you started 
um, with the cast uh, group or division in 2019. Is that right? So I started the application process in 2018 and then was fully certified in 2019. And um, was this your first case out of uh, being being in the cast group? It was not. It was one of the first, though. Okay. You t you talked a little bit about the training that you had to do, but didn't really get into it as far as the cast goes. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, the training to become certified member of the cast group? Sure. I don't mean to call it the CAST group. I don't. I don't want to. What, what is it called? So it's a, it's cellular analysis survey team. So you'll hear it called CAST team, which is kind of redundant okay. because it already says that. Um, but if you say CAST, I'll know what you're speaking of. Okay. So, uh, what is the training involved in becoming part of the CAST team? Sure. So the first training that you would go to would be our basic CAST training. Um, that is one week. And it's looking at under, kind of having an understanding of what records you can obtain from a provider and the ability to take those records and put them onto a map. So one of the biggest pieces of that is learning how to do it without a computer software package. So basically being able to talk a little bit um, about what I mentioned yesterday as far as you take call detail records, which could be printed out. You take a tower list, which also could be printed out. And then you marry those two up, and you're able to say where a tower is located. And then for a specific line in a call detail record, which tower and sector was being utilized. So that's sort of the first. Um, that training can vary. I think right now it's at two days. Um, the second training that we would go to uh, would be advanced. So advanced is a full one week. And when I talked a little bit yesterday about where you have – less and less instructor support um, as these trainings go on for the first three anyway. So by the end of that week, you're basically just given a problem and you're asked to map out that particular case of where phones were during relevant times. And then that's looked at and graded and there's a determination made of whether you would go to the next training. Um, the name of that one has changed also over the years. Uh, when I went to it, it was called the field training exercise. So in that training, it's two and a half days as well, and you're basically provided with four different cases that you have to work within a time constraint, and you're not able to ask questions about how to do things. So we make a presentation for each one of those. It's graded, and then at that point, um, a determination is made of whether you would continue on to our certification process or whether you would repeat one of those particular trainings to get more time. And did you have to repeat any of these trainings, or did you make it through basic, make it through advanced, make it through the field training all in the first try? I took each one time. One time? Yes, okay. sir. And so what's the next step after the field training two and a half days? So then there's our four-week certification process, which they break up into two two-week trainings. So during the first two-week training, that's whenever we would get instruction from university professors specific to radio frequency theory and how it works. Beyond that, we would meet with the different providers for all of the major phone carriers to include T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, and at the time, Sprint. So we meet with their legal compliance representatives, which are the ones who maintain the records that I'm speaking about. We also meet with their network engineers who explain how they set up their network and what an optimized network looks like for them. Additionally, we took a trip out to one of the network switches so we can see what that looks like, and that's where all the cell phone towers are connecting to the switch to route calls through their network. Then beyond that, we had a written test for all that information that we learned, um, and that's concluded the first two-week certification. The second two-week certification consisted of learning the drive testing equipment, learning some of the different software packages that we utilize, and then again, taking a case from beginning all the way to en the end, which included with a moot court exercise where we are basically 
presenting the case and then challenged by other members that have been in CAST for a while to ensure that the methodology we're using is correct. Thanks for bringing up the drive testing. I, I had some questions about that. Um, so the drive testing, it's not, it's not a scientific test, right? So it's an industry standard test. It's an industry standard test. Okay. Let's talk a little bit. Well, should I keep going, Judge? Anytime you want to take a break where it's logical. Mr. I'm going to kind of get into some stuff right now. So if we want to take a break, it would be good. Sure. That's fine. Okay. Let's do that. We'll take our uh, mid-morning recess, try to reconvene right around 1030. All right, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. <coughs> okay, we're back on the record on CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Mr. Thomas is conducting cross-examination of the witness, Mr. Balance. You can continue with your cross if you'd like at this time, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Balance, or uh, Special Agent Balance, would you, we were just about to talk a little bit about drive testing. Uh, can you tell me uh, what type of equipment is involved in that? Yeah, so what we're using is what's called a GAR, which is a Gladiator Autonomous Receiver. And basically what that equipment does is it collects the different RF frequencies that are being broadcast by the different cellular providers in a specific area. So in order to take measurements, you would need to drive or move that gear around. Typically, we'll do it with a car. And as we drive, it's constantly taking measurements of the different radio frequency that it's detecting with those sensors that it's utilizing. Once we get all of those particular measurements, that's whenever we would take it back into a software mapping program and would look at, and we can basically filter out specific towers and sectors and what that true coverage would look like for each individual one that it detected. And, and, and you said you did this particular test in June of 2020? Yes, sir. That's correct. And how long does that test take? So it depends on the area that we're specifically driving. So if we're just doing one tower on sector, you could feasibly do that in a day. Again, it depends on... If you're looking at just the tower and sector that's in downtown Boise, the coverage area probably is not going to go out nearly as far as in a rural area. So we're driving basically to the next tower and a little bit beyond to see how far that coverage goes. When you're talking about a rural area or you're talking about doing an entire city like Rexburg, it took us um, driving better part of a week to complete it. And that was Rexburg, Sugar City, uh, uh St. Anthony, the whole area that's in your cast report? Correct. That only took you a week to do? Correct. All right. Um, and this Gladiator Autonomous Receiver, is this a piece of equipment that is a government issue, or is this something that is uh, in the industry? So it's in the industry. The company that produces is Gladiator. Okay. Uh, I believe you indicated on direct examination uh, that you cannot, you, you, there's no way you could ever uh, be able to tell where a phone was located 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Correct. What I mean by that is that it depends on, we have to have a record in um, from one of the carriers for a specific date and time. So if we don't have a record for a specific date and time, then we're not able to um, estimate a location at that particular date and time. 
And then on top of that as well, it's dependent on the records. So if we're looking at a tower and sector that provides coverage to a large area, then the area we estimate that that phone is is going to be much larger than certain types of records that we receive, like from the Google location that have a much smaller margin of error. And in this particular case, the sectors are vast, right? I mean, they're huge. There's several towers in this case that have coverage areas that are large, yes. Okay. And so when you're saying that a particular phone is within a particular sector, I mean, that could be 40, 50 square miles, right? It depends on the tower and sector, but it could be a large area. Okay. Let's talk about in this case. How large are these areas? So without having measurements on the map to determine the square area, I mean, I think what you're getting at is that there's a large area. So if you look at particularly that tower that is in St. Anthony, it has coverage that goes down almost into Rexburg. So depending, again, without having, you know, a ruler and being able to map out that exact area, I'll definitely say it's a large area. Okay, so if I was to tell you between St. Anthony and Rexburg, it's about 12 to 15 miles in one direction, just going down the highway. Okay. And would that make sense to say, well, it's probably 12 miles one direction, and then there's also another slice of the pie, which covers maybe what uh, another 12, 15, 20 miles square? I mean, again, without looking at it on a map, I don't want to abstractly say what the square mileage would be. Okay. And so when you're, you know, when the prosecutor was uh, examining you and you were, we had all these charts and uh, very great charts if you know what you're doing and if you know what you're looking at. But for the layperson like me or something, it's a little bit difficult. And so what I, what I want to know is, is there any way to say that based on those charts, based on your readings of those charts and based on your readings of those of all that data, uh, that there's any way you can pinpoint to say that anybody was uh, on the Chad Daybell area or in the Chad Daybell um, complex or home homestead uh, without looking at the GPS. So if we're excluding completely the Google location history and we're only looking at the phones, yeah. the best way you would be able to tell whether or not a device was near the Chad Daybell residence is whenever you have two different towers and sectors being utilized in close proximity and time, and they have overlapping coverage. It still would not, in my opinion, be able to tell you that it was at the Chad Daybell residence. It would only be able to, you would only be able to say that it's consistent with it being at the Chad Daybell residence but it also could be in any of those overlapping areas that appear on the map. So would that be considered triangulation or when you're using cell towers to triangulate to try to find where a person is or where a, person, where a person's phone would be? Somewhat. Usually triangulation is based off of the measurement from particular towers, and then whenever you have multiple, the more that you have, the more you can overlap those measurements away from a particular tower. When we're talking about the drive test, what we're looking at is the true coverage area of a tower and sector compared with the true coverage area of a second tower and sector. And what that gives us is that overlap, which can be, a, as you can see from some of the maps, that shape is not exactly circular or representative of, you know, defining lines. It can look more like a cloud than anything else. Okay. But based on the evidence that you've seen, based on the data that you've crunched, uh, you couldn't place anybody at the Daybell residence based on the cell data alone. There was no, there was no triangulation. You didn't use two towers in any of these, any of the charts that I saw. Is that right? So I did use multiple towers in some of them. And what I would say is that I wouldn't be able to definitively say that that phone was only at the Daybell residence. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about September 23rd. Uh, I believe you indicated uh, that Chad Daybell's phone and Alex Cox's phone were both at the same area of Chad Daybell's home. Is that right? So when we're looking at just the phone separate from the Google location history, what you could see is that Alex Cox's phone, the number ending 9120, was utilizing a Verizon tower. And then the number, and I'm going to mess up the last four, but the, starting with 515 for Chad Daybell's number, that's utilizing the AT&T network. 
So it's utilizing two different networks and then looking at the coverage area of the towers being utilized by the Daybell phone utilizing the AT&T network versus the Verizon phone utilizing the Verizon network. But you couldn't put them on the same property at the same time based on that data? I can't put them in the exact same location. I can only put them within the coverage area of those towers and sectors. Okay. And, again, those coverage areas are miles and miles apart, right? Yes, correct. Okay. All right. And how long uh, were Alex Cox and Chad Daybell within the coverage area together on so September 23rd? I would have to look back at the slides to see the exact times. But, again, it's dependent on whenever we see those records. So as an example, if you're looking at a time of 921, and there's a record at 921, then there's also a record at, say, 942. I can't say between that time any estimated location of where a phone is. I can only estimate the location at those given times in the records. Can you explain to the jury again, because I, I was a little confused about this as well, explain to the jury again why you can sometimes read text messages that were given uh, as you did in, in your CAST report, and sometimes you, you just say that there's an SMS message or that there's a text message. Absolutely. So... There's two ways that you can get to the con well, two general ways that you can get to the content of a text message. You could do it either by looking at the phone, and basically what we would do in law enforcement would be a forensic download of that phone to pull all the data off of there. So it's dependent on an examiner of what files are there, if something's deleted, whether it's recoverable. That's separate from what I'm doing. Typically what I'm doing is I'm looking at interactions between a particular carrier and a phone, not per se what's in the phone itself. So whenever I'm doing that, it's dependent on what records are maintained by each individual carrier. So at the time, whenever this investigation was going on and the dates that I was looking for, Verizon was the only carrier that maintains content of text messages for a window of anywhere between three and seven days. It just depends on their specific, um, how many text messages go across a specific account. So after that, they don't retain them. The other carriers don't retain text messages. So the only way that I would be able to review the content of text messages would be if there was a forensic download of the phone and those messages were recoverable or we obtained records from a Verizon phone within that short window of time. And I believe, I believe you indicated you did find some content on Chad Daybell's phone. Is that right? Yes, that was on one of the Verizon phones. Okay. And you got that content within three to seven days of uh, of it being made, of the so text being made. That search warrant would have been not been done by me. Um, typically, an investigator will serve a search warrant, obtain data from a cell phone provider and then send that message, send that data to us to conduct analysis on. So I couldn't speak to when that search warrant was done. Okay. So you indicated a lot of uh, GPS location on Alex Cox. You didn't have any GPS locations on Lori Vallow or Chad Daybell. Is that right? I did not, no. Okay. You didn't use that in any of your analysis? I didn't have it to use. Okay. Uh, were you aware of how long Lori and Alex had lived in this particular area of Rexford? Roughly. Um, I know they were somewhat new to the area, but as far as dates, no, I'm not aware. If I were to tell you that they had moved there September the 1st of that same year, it's 2019, uh, and these all these records look like they're from... Uh, September the 1st through October, November, December of 2019. Does that make sense? So I know I had records prior to September the 1st, but I don't recall mapping those out to see, like, when those devices first started showing up in Rexburg. Okay. So given the fact that they had moved there, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, just assuming that they had moved there on September the 1st, there's no way that you could make any type of assumptions uh, based on patterns of, of behavior um, f for where these people were going or what they were doing, right? Objection, speculation. Overruled. 
I mean, what I was going to say is that typically when I speak on other cases, the more data we have, so for instance, if I'm looking for an individual that's wanted by law enforcement, typically what I would do is I would look at 30 days historically to try and get a pattern of what that phone's doing during those 30 days. And so, I mean, I would agree to you from this from the standpoint of the more records I have to establish what's called a pattern of life would be better. Okay. But you've indicated that in other uh, cases you have established a pattern of life based on a 30-day time frame period? A version of pattern of life. Again, it's dependent on the records because I think, like, everybody in this courtroom has – you know, a routine or something that they typically do. And if we were to examine records for the past 30 days versus for the past year, you would either see major changes or you might see the same thing. It just depends on everybody's particular situation. Okay. Um, on October the 19th, the date that uh, Tammy Daybell passed away, or the 18th, um, you, you believe that Lori's phone was in Hawaii, is that right? So from the record that I showed um, at that particular time, that device was in Hawaii. And then I would add to that, too, that, you know, it's not right around the corner. So it would take, you know, travel to get to Hawaii. Right. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any redirect from the state? Just one moment, Your Honor. Uh, Defense counsel asked you about GPS location data for Lori Daybell and Chad. Lori Vallow or Lori Daybell and Chad Daybell, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, is it possible to turn the GPS geolocation data off on your phone? It is. So as I mentioned before, um, especially with Google, that location services is based off of whether a user wants to opt in or out. And so as part of their privacy protections, you can opt out of your location being maintained by Google. That's all I have. Very well. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. More explosive testimony in this trial. We're bringing it to you as we get it. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of it wherever you download podcasts. Get an ad-free version when you subscribe through Apple Podcasts. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. Stay with us.